And now joining us on Two Steps Head podcast is somebody who has decided to throw her hat into the political arena. Pam Altendorf is joining us. She is running for the House of Representatives for the state of Minnesota, a place that uh, is actually home to a lot of my family. In fact, I'm actually first generation outside of Minnesota, so a lot of roots there. And after the last couple of major political years, 2016, 2020, especially when it comes to the presidential election and national elections, We've had some, uh, it seems like the tone of politics has gotten really worse. I mean, it's always kind of been a nasty business, but it seems like it's gotten worse the last couple of election cycles. And so what made you decide to kind of throw your hat in that arena and get involved into uh, politics? Thanks for having me on today to interview me. Uh, It's a great question. I would say 2016 as you said, started to get a little bit ugly with politics, but that was the year I really started paying a lot more attention. It seemed like what was happening, especially with the presidential election, uh, what you would hear on the mainstream news media, and then um, what was actually happening in reality just wasn't matching up. So for example, for my business, I have a large sales business that spreads across the United States. And in the fall of 2016, I had been to something like 12 different states. So when I saw everywhere that Hillary was supposed to win by, you know, what the polls were saying, 97% or something like that, um, I truthfully was not seeing a Hillary Clinton sign anywhere across America that I was traveling. So I started to become very skeptical of the news. And a good friend of mine who, uh, she was a journalist out of Chicago that I respect very much. I said, what are we supposed to do? I, I feel like we're not getting the correct news. And She really steered me to start listening to independent journalists. And um, that's what I did. I really, I would say in 2016, started to deep dive and do my own research, you know, follow many different um, news media. But just to break away from that regular mainstream news is, is important. I think that's important for everyone to do at some point. Yeah, the other thing that I do is I don't go to the generic internet search engines and their news. I actually go to like a new source. So for example, not to be partisan on anything, but if I wanted to check out a new story, I'd actually go to Fox News. I'd go to CNN. I'd go to all the specific sites themselves. So that way I can find out firsthand from those sources. And then from there, like you said, you go to more of an independent journalist perspective, and then you can really kind of weed out what's going on. At least that's how I like to do it and get like the truth so that when I'm talking, not only can I see the perspective of people that just normally take in whatever the headlines are, but then I can also get more of an understanding of what's going on from different perspectives. And I think that's kind of wise for people to do is take a look at the news outside of the mainstream and you might get a little bit more in depth and knowledgeable as to the topics that are going on. As far as the news goes, um, so you're running, it's grassroots. I believe that the country today really needs a lot of grassroots from the ground up. Not going to be able to solve the problems from the top down because the top is just too far gone into their politics, the theology of politics. I don't think they're going to change anything. So it has to come from the bottom up, the communities, the neighborhoods, the small towns, and then build up from there. How has your experience been with like local media and things of that nature when you've been dealing at the grassroots, smaller level of politics? I couldn't agree with you more as far as we have to make a change in our state, in our country, but it starts locally. And that's why I started getting involved. Uh, It was about January of 2021. Small group of us locally, we started to meet weekly and uh, started a grassroots group. And it really was just a group to connect with each other. And um, from there, we started, we, we were really about education. So we would have speakers come in and talk about a lot of different subjects uh, from, you know, how do you write a legislator? How do you effectively do that <clears throat> to green energy? And, you know, what is the truth behind green energy? So we started this group and what that did was really empowered people to feel like they had more education that then they could go out and make a difference. But going back to the media locally, uh, you know, we see this here in the, in the newspapers as well. I don't, I don't know if they're always doing a great job of reporting the stories um, so that it's easy to understand. Or so, for example, in my race right now, there's two Republicans 
running for the House race, and this is a primary election. That's very, very uncommon for my district. And when I'm out door knocking, I would say, and I'm, I'm door knocking Republicans, I would say 50% of the Republicans don't even understand that there's two Republicans still running for the same race. When you look at the issues, we have the, the national politics and the reports are you've got the economy, you know, gas prices are high, we've got inflation, we've got things on the shelves not being there when we have to go get groceries. Um, you have inflation on everybody's minds. And so when you take a look at kind of the things that are important on a national level to voters, do you find that the same as you're going door to door, talking to people, the issues? I mean, because a lot of times what I guess is important to some people, I know we've had Roe v. Wade uh, overturned by the Supreme Court. You know, we have LGBT things going on, and a lot of people would like to tell us that those need to be first and foremost on the voting ballot. But yet when it comes to just the average family, the average person, you know, we're looking more economy. We're looking at, like you said, you know, with schools, I mean, parents are really taking charge. You've got to fight the school board, not only the teachers. And so uh, school choice seems to be a topic that a lot of just average families are in, uh, wanting to know more about. What are some of the issues that you are finding when you're out there talking to people? Yeah, you're right. Obviously, right now, this is this is across the board, you know, the economy, the inflation, the gas prices, the high grocery prices, you know, those those are the talking points. But I will admit those are also the very easy talking points and a little bit of a cop out when uh, you have other uh, people that are running for political office and they're only talking about those points in the last two years in our country. You know, we have more than ever seen our constitutional rights um, really be threatened. We closed down businesses and for the first time, uh, business owners, small business owners especially, were told you don't have the right to work. Uh, we closed down churches and we were told that you don't have the right to worship. Uh, we have gone through mask mandates and uh, vaccines um, pushing this. So those are medical choices. Um, that, you know, should be protected, that, that people should have the right to choose what's, what's best for them um, and for their bodies and for their family. And so we can talk about those general issues because those are affecting us across the board, inflation, taxes, gas prices, that's affecting everybody. However, that's really not the deepest problems of our country right now. And we have to look at what are the biggest issues um, and it, it really is a deterioration of our constitutional rights. It also is um, where business, or I'm sorry, government has just really gotten too big, too inflated, and they are no longer listening to the people anymore. Yeah, you're right about that. It seems like politicians come out every four years or two years or whatever the, the election cycle is. They want your vote. They promise you everything, and then when they go back to wherever it is they're going to, whether it be a, a state uh, government or a federal government uh, level, they just go back to doing whatever they want to do for themselves. So what are you going to do? What are some of your passions when it comes to wanting to see change? And so you're out there, you're running, people are asking you, what are you about? What are some of those issues that you stand strong that you would like to really tackle when you get to St. Paul? Yeah, and, and I know there's there's so many issues right now. Um, I'm encouraged to see many other people like myself running. Um, you can call us, you know, just, you know, regular everyday people, um, moms and dads that are getting involved, business owners, people from across our state and across our nation. You're seeing new faces running. Uh, one of the biggest problems really is our government structure right now. It's It's the political elites, let's call them, that are on the inside and they are uh, possibly being controlled um, by PACs, by lobbyists, um, and they're not representing the people anymore. We, Our government was founded that we should have servant leaders go and serve in government and then leave, not to stay there for a long term, not to become lifelong politicians, and certainly not to profit off of the office. And so I am running as a servant leader uh, to go to St. Paul to bring accountability, to bring transparency back to our state government. 
And right now, more than ever, we need to have voters really being educated and not being manipulated, not letting emotions run them, um, and really being educated on the candidates so that they're aware of candidates that are running for the right reasons and candidates that are possibly falling into that trap of becoming part of that political establishment, which is the root cause of the problems in our state and our country. So when you take a look at, at Minnesota, because you have, you know, you have the, the coast, you have the left coast in California, Washington, Oregon, then you have, uh, you know, DC, you know, and, and new England. And, and so you get, a majority of the population on the coast trying to dictate to the rest of the country. But what they don't understand is you've got rural America, you've got farming America, you've got, you know, all these different industries, agriculture, things that don't really go or fit into the city life of New York, LA, Chicago. So for Minnesota specifically in, in your district, uh, district 20, which is uh, what, like the Red Wing area, right? Yep, correct. Um, what are some of the things that you guys need to do at the state level to help those people that are kind of struggling at, in those uh, industries? Right. Um, so my tagline or what I've been putting on all my literature and pretty much every answer comes back to less government, more freedom. It's the idea and the concept that government has gotten too big and um, they're overregulating us. They're overtaxing us. And the burdens are, are too much for the average you know, citizen or small business to handle. So, for example, uh, earlier, a couple of months back, I went on a tour of an ethanol plant. And in the state of Minnesota, this plant has been waiting five years to get a, a, some, um, just a single um, thing that was they needed to have approved by the government and application. And they're waiting on that. And it's for just a simple um, thing for them to improve their facilities. Now, what's happening in Minnesota is we are one of the five uh, top highest states. So we are a very blue democratic state, or at least we have been. We are trending to become more Republican in the last few years. Um, but Minnesota, just like every other blue state, you know, I, I try to encourage people to look at facts and it's the truth is the big cities, the, the real blue cities and the states that are blue are the ones with the highest taxes, highest crime rates. And so going back to just my tagline is less government, more freedom. We have to control government. We have to like get in there, cut, cut regulations so businesses can be productive. In Minnesota, we have to reevaluate the tax system we are one of only 13 states that are still taxing the social security tax for um, or social security for seniors. That needs to be eliminated. And so these are some of the things that right off the bat we can do in Minnesota to help make our state productive, but to also stop driving um, citizens out of our state that are going to other states that do not have these tax burdens that we have here in Minnesota. Yeah, you mentioned, you know, kind of the liberal Democrats there. You know, take a look at uh, at Minneapolis. You know, you've got what Elon Omar, who is now the you know representative in Washington. You had Keith Ellison there for, you know, however many years he was there. And that's right in the heart of, of Minneapolis. But then once you get outside of the Minneapolis St. Paul area, you start to get into more of a rural agricultural society. Is there really a disconnect or is there a difference between what goes on actually in the cities versus what you see? out in kind of the rural areas of Minnesota? Do you see a difference in thought and politics and religion and things like that? Yeah, most definitely uh, there is a, a disconnect. You know, we have just a few cities in Minnesota, uh, Rochester, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Duluth, that are deciding our elections. And by far the majority of our state is red to deep red. Our house district here that I'm currently in um, last time in 2020, the Republican won 59%. And so we are a, a strong conservative, strong Republican district. Uh, and there is a bit of a disconnect that we're seeing the, the landowners and um, many, much of the tax base that's coming out of Minnesota um, is in the broader areas of Minnesota. And yet it is these small um, inner city areas that are deciding our elections. 
And so, um, yeah, we, we definitely need a little bit more representation for the rural areas. And I think I hear that often that we don't feel represented. One of the important things, obviously, is education. And we've seen an assault on education across the country over the last couple of years. I mean, first off, you have uh, school boards that are sitting there and trying to do everything they can to keep parents out of schools. They don't want parents to have any choice or any say in what the curriculum is. And then beyond the, the school boards, you've got things like critical race theory being taught. You've got in some areas, depending, I guess, where you're at, you've got uh, LGBT and that ideology. You've got now this whole thing about uh, trans drag shows and reading story times and stuff. I mean, it seems like it's really gotten over the top that people that are in education want to do anything and everything but educate the kids. They'd rather indoctrinate them. So... Again, when you're dealing with going into politics and you're talking to parents and they might be concerned because they're, what they want for their kids might not be what, you know, Minneapolis or St. Paul wants or, you know, Rochester or if you're in another state, you know, the capitals and the big cities seem to dictate a lot of things. Um, so what can you do to kind of deal with those educational issues from your level at the grassroots and in those smaller communities? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought up education because that is a, a big topic happening here in Minnesota. It's something I've been very concerned about. In June, uh, myself and um, Steve Droskowski is running for the Senate. Uh, we did town halls in five different towns just to listen to the voters. We wanted to hear their concerns, and a lot of them are based around education, so it is a hot topic. The one thing that is important to note, you know, that we have great teachers. Um, our administration in the school where my child went, they did a great job this last year. Our school board was great. They never masked the kids in my school. They allowed it to be mask choice. And so when we're talking about these issues, it is a really a broad issue in the state of Minnesota. And what we are seeing is something, it's a CRT, critical race theory, uh, being creeped into our schools. So even in small districts where I'm at, small rural districts, you know, we might have the greatest teachers, but some of this language, uh, that it also is coming in under the term uh, SEL, social emotional learning. And this is coming into the schools, it's coming in through textbooks, it's creeping in. And so I just wanted to make clear, it's not necessarily the teachers or the administration. This is a much bigger problem, a statewide problem that we have to address. So, um, and, and as you said, it's, um, it's something I've been very concerned about. Uh, I've posted some things on my Facebook page and um, it's alarming. It's, it's really alarming to see what's coming into the schools, um, what's being presented to our children. We had a, we had a, questionnaire that went out to children, you know, that was asking very, very private questions that I'm assuming most, you know, seventh, eighth, ninth graders who were asked these questions didn't even know the answers to many of these things um, that they were asking, like, what is a pansexual? And so that those kind of questions being asked, you have to, you have to wonder, even a medical doctor doesn't go that deep with your children. And what is the state of Minnesota doing with these questions? Why are they being asked? And is this a breach of privacy? So that is my concern, is always protecting the children. And um, this collecting of this data, um, that it's, it's just, it's not right. But in a way, it almost seems like if you can look at it, um, is this grooming? Are we introducing concepts to children that at these young ages they would have never thought about? And also, I know parents um, in schools very close to us, 20, 30 miles away, that they pulled books out of the schools, um, schools library, that again, were very, very inappropriate for children. Um, talking about sexual natures and many things that, you know, I don't want to say maybe uh, publicly, but that are disgusting. And certainly children as young as five and six are not asking these questions um, we need to protect children's innocence and uh, and let's let's be aware of what's coming into our schools and, and really, really start to push back on this. But that's one thing that I've been very proud of is I have been going to the school boards um, way before I decided to run for political office. That was one of the things I've been doing this last year. And um, I'm so excited to see at a grassroots level to see parents getting involved and running for school boards 
and um, people running for city council, because uh, that's exactly what we need to fix this, is just to get more citizens back involved and to be realizing what's happening. Yeah, because as that stuff trickles down from the top, like you said, through curriculum, through textbooks, through whatever source it's trickling down from, if you guys are kind of that barrier or that dam there, you can push back on that and kind of protect the kids from having to experience that. I mean, how many times have we seen somebody, a parent, go check out a book from apparently the school's library, read it at a school board meeting, and then gets cut off because the content is, you know, salacious, it's sexual, it's, you know, inappropriate, even in an adult setting, and yet this is the stuff that's sitting in the library. So, again, I can see where the importance of getting people in the right positions, even at the lower levels, like the the city uh, city councils, you know, the local school boards, you know, mm -hmm. because then you have a buffer when this stuff trickles down that you guys can really push back and fight against. Right. I am. I'm very excited to see the local involvement. I'm very excited to see. You know, at a school board meeting, it, it nobody used to come to school board meetings. And, you know, now it seems like there were parents present at almost every school board meeting. And so this is a good thing. And hopefully the, the teachers, the school administration, everybody sees this as a positive thing, is that we are working together collaboratively to make make the best decisions for, for the children. But there certainly has been a very concerning push of this indoctrination you can call it sexual exploitation that has been coming into the schools at a very, very young age at five, six years old. That's very concerning. And, and I would just say this is a problem with privacy and then it's not the school's place. Um, some of these social issues need to be left up to the parents. Another big hot button issue is the second amendment. And you've got, uh, again, all different people weighing in on it. You've got, again, one of those, uh, situations where one size does not fit all as far as answers. You've got, you know, the cities versus rural areas. And so when it comes to the Second Amendment, guns rights, how has that affected uh, you guys in your area when it comes to the Second Amendment and, and what people want in your community when you talk with them? Yeah, that's, this is something that everyone, you know, that I'm talking about, the conservatives, the Republicans, um, they're concerned about what happened at the national level. They don't want, or we just have to stay very strong on this issue. Let's put it that way. Uh, when when Minnesota, this district elects me, I am very strong supporting the Second Amendment. I have been from the beginning. And <clears throat> one of my, I think it was the Goodhue County uh, Convention, you know, I did a five minute speech and it was facts over fear. And I really look at everything analytically, and as a society, we have to acknowledge that the media is controlling and, <clears throat> excuse me, manipulating our emotions. The media, I'll repeat that, the media is controlling and manipulating our emotions. And we have to step back and we have to look at closely, so when something as this huge tragedy happened in, in recently at that school, um, we're seeing 24 seven hour, you know, news cycle with them, you know, reporting on and somehow the gun is the problem, the gun is the problem, you know, so it is emotionally manipulating people to think that guns are the problem. Okay, so now if we could take a step back, what I always say is facts over fear, is everywhere there's the strongest, strictest gun laws, so you don't have to look very far, but like in Chicago, you know, we have record amount of gun crime, um, uh, murders by gun. And so you cannot say that by doing stricter gun legislation, it is going to stop the gun crime. You know, people know this, uh, but again, we're being so controlled and manipulated by the media, we forget. Um, where there's more guns, there's less crime. Because for example, a shooter, maybe oftentimes, either is having problems with mental health issues, is possibly on drugs. And when they're going to do something like this, they're actually looking for a soft target like a school where there is no guns to stop them. Now, in contrast, if we knew that there was some sort of armed guard or, or something in the schools, I would, I would believe these school shootings would go down to almost zero. And so we can't continue to leave our children be targets um, like that. And I think pretty easily we could put funding or dollars towards 
making sure that um, these gun crimes or these these type of situations that have happened in the past could could drastically be reduced with some common sense. Yeah, I mean, I take a look at teachers and, you know, they go to school, they come out of high school and they decide, I want to be a teacher. So you go to college to become a teacher and you learn all the things it takes to be a teacher. But then you're put in a classroom and now all of a sudden you have to make the decision. OK, I have to put my life on the line and I don't know how to do that because I was taught how to teach, not to how to be security, not how to save lives. And so it's a completely different thing. And so it's we're asking a lot more of a teacher these days in the world we live in without properly preparing them. You know, we wouldn't send them into the classroom without the degree, without maybe their state licensing. You know, there's a lot of requirements that goes into it. So why not add to that and provide a safe education experience for the students so that they know when they're at school, they're going to be safe. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of people just are disconnected with. They'd rather promote an ideology in curriculum rather than just keep the kids safe at school. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, I would never ask a teacher, I would never want a teacher to feel like they were burdened, you know, to do this, to protect the children. However, it's not very, um, you know, it would be something that would need to be researched. I believe something like this is happening in another state, um, but it's not coming to me right now what state it is. Um, however, it wouldn't take much. It could be a janitor. It could be, um, you know, the football coach that is also the science teacher. It could be someone that was ex-military, and it would be someone that obviously would have to have that background check, would have to go through classes and make sure that they were capable for the situation. But again, it just goes back to if if someone who's in this state of mind, in, in this terrible state of mind that they are wanting to go do harm to people, if they were aware that even one or two people in that school were armed, um, I would I would suggest that these type of instances would greatly decrease or almost stop. And then one final topic to touch on, we had Roe v. Wade in the Supreme Court uh, kind of, well, not really overturned, but just said that it goes back to the states, okay? So we're not going to have this nationalized um, debate on abortion right now. It goes back to the states. Each state can choose what they want to do. And so now we've got this big fight going on state by state as to what we're going to do. Um, one of the things that's hard to do is have conversations about this because people, A, they're uh, hypocritical in their conversations. For example, someone who is pro-choice might say, my body, my choice, but yet turn around and mandate that we stick a needle in our arms and get a vaccine if we don't want it and then call us all kinds of names. Um, two, you've got you know money behind this business that a lot of people are making a lot of money, so you can't have an honest conversation about it. Three, most importantly, it seems like the the you know whether it's the the woman because she just isn't ready or it's a young child because maybe there was an assault whatever the case may be it seems like that person and the baby are the last two that are considered when it comes to this conversation it seems like everything else is prioritized in the conversation as opposed to the woman and the baby and what they need and what they have are going through so when it comes to this um, what are your thoughts and what do you think can be done to kind of create a dialogue to not one size fits all? I mean, because you've got people talking about, you know, oh, if the mother's health is in danger, then she's going to die because there's no abortion. I mean, it's like all this kind of crazy talk and nobody has any rhyme or reason or any common sense when it comes to having a dialogue. Everybody's just completely divided and we can't, can't talk about it yet. It's probably one of the most um, one of the biggest issues that's driving America right now as far as people that are suffering and struggling with this decision that they have to make. Mm -hmm. um, so this is an ex a great example of another emotionally manipulated topic. And right away when Roe versus Wade got overturned, it's the media is spinning the emotions out of control. So what Roe versus Wade happened at the federal level is they just specifically said, this is not a federal issue. You do not have a constitutional right to have an abortion. And that was a correct decision. This needs to go back to the states. Our federal government was never meant to do the things that we're asking it to do. And again, it goes back to the, it being too inflated and that we need to uh, get reins on that. Um, but back to Roe versus Wade. So in a state like Minnesota, nothing has changed here. And yet the media has somehow tried to whip up the public in this frenzy to make us think that there's going to be women in the back alleys dying because they're going to have abortions in back alleys. So it, it is truthfully, it's not true. 
And we have to stop this reacting emotionally um, by the state's decisions. If a state, say like California, decides to have abortions legal and a state, you know, down the road, Texas doesn't, then you can make that decision to live in California or to live in, in Texas. And so this, this whipping up everyone into a frenzy, it's not healthy, um, it divides people, it's untruthful. And um, I, I think as a nation, we have to really be aware, and I keep on saying like protect our emotions because we should not be driven by these emotions. Um, we, should be, we should be looking for the facts of these situations. Pam Altendorf is my guest. And as we wrap things up, anything else you'd like to uh, share as you go into this uh, election that's, that's coming up and it's the vote's coming up and people are going to decide where they want District 20 to go, what direction they're heading in? Anything else you'd like to share? I guess, you know, the big reason I ran, I, I put my, everyone says, throw throws your hat in the ring. Um, you know, I was frustrated with how things have been going the last two years. And um, I really felt like, you know, to run for political office, you have to check these boxes. Uh, with my professional experience of being in sales, I knew I could public speak. You know, I knew I had these resources to be able to run. And I really felt like if I could check those boxes that I wanted to step up to do something um, to help the situation, you know, to be that grassroots candidate, to be someone that's coming from the outside, that's not coming in with these political connections. And so what I would say to anyone that's listening right now is we have watched in the last two years, you know, we've been losing our freedoms. Um, our government is way too big. Our government is way too inflated. And you see over and over the media is driving us by fear. So what I would suggest to the public is, first of all, protect your emotions, really research facts, really research candidates. Um, we're, we're in this place for a reason, and it's maybe because we've gotten a little lazy, um, and it's definitely because too many big interest groups, big pharma, you know, political elites are trying to control our government, our political atmosphere. And the only way we're going to bring real change is if we do elect people like myself, who's coming from the outside and who's trying to take this bottom up approach that's really representing the people and not representing this establishment that seems like they have so much power and so much control. But I am very, very hopeful. I am seeing other candidates just like myself stepping up and uh, really wanting to make a difference. And so to the public, Protect your emotions. Stop allowing the mainstream media to control you by fat fear. And um, just really be a part of the change. Get involved locally. Go to local meetings. Get involved in city council, um, school board, and just attending meetings. Um, it is not a time to be sitting on the sidelines anymore. We have to have citizenship. We have to have, we have to people getting um, involved at a, at a citizen level to make a real change in our, in our state and then in our country. Pam, where can people find you? Is there a website, social media, any place where if they want to find out more information or maybe donate or whatever the case may be, they can uh, find more about you? Yeah, thanks. Um, it's pmaltendorf.com. It's A-L-T-E-N-D-O-R-F.com. Uh, Altendorf for House is my Facebook page, and I have an alt I have a Rumble channel, um, so you can look for me there. But uh, yeah, we 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 are um, really looking for donations right now. Um, we're running in the Republican primary, and uh, the swamp uh, has gotten involved in my race, um, and many many flyers are coming out from lobbyist groups uh, trying to defeat me. So, which I find a little bit um, interesting and humorous that they are getting involved in a primary election and in an area that where Republicans are running by winning by almost 10%. And I would ask all the citizens to ask why, <laughs> why are lobbyist groups getting involved and in supporting my opponent? And I think when you start to look deep and research, you'll find those answers. And I, I would appreciate your support. Pam Altendorf running for the Minnesota House of Representatives, District 20, the Red Wing, Minnesota area. Uh, check out our website. And, uh, Pam, thanks so much for joining us, and we look forward to see how this all plays out, and we wish you all the best. Thank you for having me on today. I appreciate it.